My father was a, uh, a homicide detective with the LAPD, and when I was growing up, I uh, had a great deal, and still do have a great deal of respect and admiration for him. And obviously, as a young boy, I wanted to hear about what my dad did. And as I got a little bit uh, older, he started to tell me about some of the cases he would go to when I can remember waking up in the middle of the night to see my dad responding to a call and leaving. And um, as he got a little bit more specific with me, the older I got, I remember asking him, how is it possible that people will do this to one another? And he said, Nick, you will be shocked at the justification that is used by people in order to commit certain acts. And after going to war, I started to understand what he was talking about. And as I started to share some of my own stories, he told me, Nick, he goes, the worst part is not when you're shocked, the worst part is when you stop being shocked. So I was sitting in a Senate committee meeting on Friday in defense of the Born Alive Act. And that's a little bit personal to me because when my own mother got pregnant with me, she had a lot of people encouraging her to abort me. It was going to be better for me and better for her. She made a different decision, and it cost her quite a bit to do it. I was lucky in that respect because we had a witness that testified, Robin Sertel. And she began off her testimony in that committee saying, thank you very much, madam, and thank you, members of the committee. I am a survivor of three failed saline abortion infusion attempts. For those who don't know what that is, it involves the injecting of a toxic salt solution in the amniotic fluid surrounding me in the womb. The intent of that toxic salt solution was to poison and scald me to death. Typically, the procedure lasts about 72 hours as the child soaks in the toxic solution until their life is effectively ended by it, and then premature labor is induced, expelling the deceased child from the womb. Right after she gave that testimony, talking about her experience, and keep in mind, this is not a bill that outlawed saline abortions. It's not a bill that outlawed any abortion. It was a bill that said that if the child survives it, they're entitled to basic, reasonable care to try to protect their life. And right after she shared this, Planned Parenthood got up and said that this bill was a solution in search of a problem. They said my bill was full, full of hateful rhetoric that was designed to stigmatize people. I think it was at that moment, Mr. Speaker, that I truly understood what my father was saying. He goes, it's not when you're shocked about these moments that really troubles you. It's when you stop being shocked. Because, Mr. Speaker, when Planned Parenthood did that right after a victim testified, I wasn't shocked at all. I wasn't shocked when the bill died. I wasn't shocked when I couldn't get a single colleague on the other side of the aisle to vote for it. The question is, is will the bill be back? Yes, Mr. Speaker, it will. For as long as I'm here or anybody else, it will come back. And the reason why is very simple, because my father also taught me something else, and that is when the innocent are in peril, the strong have an obligation and a duty to stand up and defend them, even if they're the only ones to do it. And at some level, Mr. Speaker, when we are talking about the Born Alive Act, a child born alive, being entitled to certain medical care, this is a basic test of humanity. And before I listen to one more lecture about the least of these among us, about the poor, about the marginalized in society, I would like to think that we can at least agree that in a situation like this, we're going to stand up and ensure that this child gets a basic level of care.